Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 9 a.m. If you're in the neighborhood, you'd like to come by and join us here physically, we'd love to have you here. <clears throat> We're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Today, we will be in the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> Give uh, Facebook a little bit of time to see if anyone joins us before we get started. So. We were blessed yesterday with, uh, I kept thinking, what do I call him? Dr. David Hawkins, and then it was Pastor Hawkins, and then it was David. <laughs> I was nervous. But what a beautiful day, and then we ended it with so many people here at the party and mm -hmm. kids having fun. It was a long day, but it was a blessed day. So good morning again this Monday morning. Let's go ahead and, and pray. Uh, gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercies. Uh, Father, we cannot, we cannot fathom the love that you have for us, Lord. It is so great. It is so wide. Uh, it is so deep, Lord. We can truly never understand. God is not moved or changed by our sinful actions, Lord, by our flesh, Lord. His love is so immense, Lord, that we can never measure it. And that love, Lord, is for all of us, Lord, for us as individuals and it's for humanity, Lord. I don't think that um, we can ever, ever understand it, Lord. It's an amazing love that God has for us, Lord. And all we simply need to do is to receive Jesus Christ into our hearts. And he promised that he'll give us eternal life. We pray, Lord, that we would um, be blessed by your word today as we continue to look at our Savior Jesus and all that he is and all that he's done for us, Father, and how much greater he is than any religious system that is out there, Father. Any, any out there, Lord God, that is man-made or brought about by satanic um, rituals, Father, or satanic uh, beings, Lord, there is nothing, nothing as great as Jesus Christ, as death on the cross and resurrection and ascension into heaven, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that it's just a simple gospel message that he died, he resurrected, and all we need to do is believe in him and have a relationship with him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So chapter 9 of Hebrews. Good morning, Dina, Allie. Glad you guys could join us. Chapter 9. Um, Again, the, the context is still that Jesus is above it all. He is greater than it all. And, and there is nothing that can, we can compare to, to Jesus Christ, any religious system. And, and, and again, let me say this and make this clear. And I know that some of you might not believe me. You know, um, it's hard to believe. It's hard to understand. But it is what the Bible teaches. And if you are to read the New Testament alone... You know, I'm not saying don't, don't read the Old Testament. Old Testament is important, but the Old Testament is under a different dispensation. It's under the dispensation of the law. So God is handling situations differently under the Old Testament. You have to understand that the New Testament is under dispensation of grace. And grace basically is favor. And God's grace is upon humanity. It's upon his children. And, and he wants to continue to have a relationship with us, not a religion. And... and you have to read the New Testament understanding that it's not a religion. It is a relationship with God himself. God became man. He dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so this man, Jesus, came to this earth from heaven, existing forever, to come to this earth so that he can relate to us. So he becomes now a high priest to us greater than Moses, greater than Levitical priesthood, greater than the Old Testament law, greater than any sacrifice, greater than any altar, greater than any tabernacle, greater than the Holy of Holies. He is above it all. And it's all about having a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what saves you, not religion. Religion is man-made and it does bring destruction. And there's truth to those who oppose Christianity. When they say we don't like religion because it brings devastation at times. And I agree with you, it does. But we're not pushing religion. We are pushing relationship with Jesus Christ. And so is the uh, author of the book of Hebrews. 
So if you read with me chapter 9, verse 1, it says, Then indeed, even the first covenant, which is the Old Testament law, again, that's the covenant. And, and the word covenant encompasses two individuals making an agreement together. Always there has to be more than one in a covenant. The word testament only includes a person uh, giving his testament or his promise or his inheritance as an individual. Like in, for instance, um, we, you know, we make wills today. And that will is designed for that one individual and what he wants to do with the things that he owns and how he wants to give it out. That's his testament and he does it with it as he sees fit. Uh, to those that he loves, or to strangers, or to nonprofits, or to Calvary Chapel Inland, whatever he wants to do with his inheritance. <laughs> um, that's his, his prerogative to do so. And so there's a difference between covenant and testament, and it's important to understand that. So here he's talking about the first covenant, the law with the children of Israel, had ordinances. Ordinances are laws and regulations and rules, that's religion, of divine service and earthly sanctuary. For the tabernacle was prepared. The first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary or the holy place. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the ta tablets of the covenant, that is the Ten Commandments, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So he, again, he's looking at the Old Testament tabernacle, which was surrounded by a fence, walls with one entrance into the courtyard, and then in the courtyard you'd have all the berries and altars, the uh, sacrifices of the wash basin, and then there's another room, you go into that, and that is where the priests go in to minister to the Lord, and then there's the Holy of Holies, where the priest goes in once a year, and you have the lampstand in there, the showbread in there, and then the Ark of the Covenant, which has Aaron's bud, uh, budded staff, the Ten Commandments are all in that Ark of the Covenant. Cherubim sits above all of that. So all of that, he's giving you that picture of that Old Testament covenant. Now, he goes on in verse 6, says, When these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. And so once a year, there had to be a sacrifice. Blood had to be shed in order for sins to be forgiven. So the priest would offer up for himself first because he needed to cover his own sins. And then he would enter into the Holy of Holies and offer up a sacrifice to the Lord. That's how they did it in the Old Testament. Now, it was symbolic of the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to this conscience, concerning only with food and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Uh, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. So even to the day of Christ, they still had priests. They still had to keep those uh, covenant that they made with God. They still had to go into the, the Holy of Holies and offer up the sacrifices and have all of the washings and ceremonies that they would do just to enter in, just to be cleansed. The high priest literally had to cleanse his hand. His hands couldn't be dirty. And there was a whole ceremony around all that, how he'd stick his hands in the wash basins, clean his hands all up, and then he'd take his hands and let the water drip down towards his elbows so that any defilement would flow down. And as it's flowing down, then he would wipe his elbows, and then he was prepared and ready. It was all a ceremony of washing of hands. And then Christ came. Uh, which is far greater, not a tabernacle made with hands, but one of the heavenlies. So Jesus is our tabernacle today. We dwell within him and he dwells within us. He is our holy of holies. And he offered himself up as a sacrifice, as he'll say here. So the new covenant now, verse 12. 
not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having ordained eternal redemption, um, or having obtained eternal redemption. Jesus' sacrifice obtained eternal, that is, forever and ever and ever, salvation. Once and for all, his death was enough to pay for the sins of the world. Now, that happened back then, right? So how is it that we are able to take hold of it because it happened back then, because it's eternal. It continues on. So we're saved by what Jesus has done in the past. And that sacrifice of his life was enough to last eternally. So not just for us, but for the next generation and for generations after, that salvation is still available to them for salvation. So it's an ongoing salvation in the sense that it was already paid for. And all we have to do now is take it. There's nothing that needs to be done but our free will of choosing him to be our savior of our flesh. For if the blood of bulls and goats, verse 13, and sacrifices for the purifying of the flesh, uh, how much more shall the blood of Jesus, who through eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purged your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Wow, how powerful that is that God would literally purge us from our sins. His blood was strong enough to cleanse us from sin. I don't know if you've ever felt this way um, because of the sensitivity that some believers have when they get saved. It's such an emotional experience and they sense the presence of the Lord and the Holy Spirit entering them, uh, that they literally feel the weight of sin being removed. And then when sin is still there in its presence, uh, they feel in the sense dirty from it and they need it removed. Um, almost as though, you know, you've done something so bad you want to go in the shower and just scrub yourself, you know, it's like, oh, can this come off, you know, and it just won't come off. And that sense there. Uh, and that's what sin does. It makes you feel that way. Um, but Christ, his blood, is so much more powerful than any soap that's out there. I don't care what you, you could get gasoline with uh, borax, you know, and try to scrub yourself. And then you ain't going to get clean because the sin is inside. It's in the heart. It's the very fiber of your nature. It's, it's who you are, who, who we became because Adam and Eve sinned. And so we're sinners. Now, people will say, well, that's so wrong. That's so bad. Why do you call us sinners? We're good people at heart. No, we're not. We're not. But that's okay. That's okay because Jesus took care of that. Jesus isn't saying, you know, you're so sinners that you're no good and you'll never be any good and you'll never amount to anything. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, recognize that, that in our hearts, we have the tendency to do evil than good. And so God has come to deliver us and all we need to do now is give our hearts to God. He'll cleanse it and wash it. And now we'll have a tendency to want to do good and not evil. It changes. And we become, not that we become good people, but we become righteous because of Jesus' righteousness has been imputed to us. And so we're righteous now by God. Not our own righteousness, but his righteousness. Because we're still evil in the sense in our heart, but yet we have now a desire to do good with God. So that blood of Jesus Christ is powerful by the Holy Spirit to cleanse us and wash us. So you don't have to go and take a shower now. All you do is say, Lord, would you just forgive me? And it's forgiven. Now, if you feel guilty and you feel like you're not forgiven, then you're believing the lie. And you have to, by faith, believe that Jesus has forgiven you. That may be difficult at first if you're a new believer, but the more you practice that and believe it in your mind that Jesus' blood and death on the cross is so great that it has cleansed me from all my sins, not just past and not just my present sins, which is nice, my present ones, the ones I'm going to do in a couple of minutes or an hour or so, but he's cleansed me from all that, but also the future ones. That's how great it is, and you have to believe that, and as you practice that, then you start walking um, in that forgiveness constantly. And by the way, that's applicable not just for you, but for the people that rub you the wrong way. That forgiveness is for them too, and we can't forget that. Because sometimes people do rub us the wrong way. Sometimes people don't do what we expect them to do. I'm guilty of that. In these past years, I'm learning. I say that quite often, don't I? 
um, learning, and I'm constantly learning um, how precious God's people are uh, to him, how much he really does love them so much, even with all their little quirks, you know, and differences and so forth. Uh, yesterday, as, as we had Dave Hawking here, Dr. Dave Hawking, um, both of him and his wife were just so moved that we minister to this disabled home over here and that they come here every Sunday to to hear the word of God uh, they don't have transportation we're so close that they just walk to this place and, and he was like these are the downcast these are the people that are the lowest of lowest and you are there where you're ministered just like Jesus would have done he didn't go to the religious leaders he didn't go to the elite you know he went to the downcast to the to the people that people look down to, and even the downs that look down to the downs, you know, he went to those, and, and those are the ones he ministered to. He says, you are right there in the midst. He goes, God bless you guys for doing that. They were so touched by, by all that goes on here and how we reach out. And, and I says, you know, because he asked me, 24 years you've been here? He says, that is amazing. I go, I'm called here. Some people look at ministry as a career, and they go where the rich people are. They go where the money's at because they know it's going to, you know, um, provide for them. I think he he was sharing with me that that there was in school a young man that was there in school and and. Uh, he didn't really believe, or someone was sharing, maybe it wasn't Dave, but they didn't really believe the stuff. And they asked him, well, why are you here in seminary school? He says, because there's money in this religious thing. You know? And he's like, that's, that's the attitude that some men have. It's not a calling, it's a career. And it's far from a career. And by the way, God sees through that. You know? And I think God sees that your heart, that it's a calling. This is a calling for me. That's why God has called me here. And I haven't left in 24 years and probably ain't going to leave until I die because God's called me here and it's not a career to go to the next step. Uh, sometimes that's what denominations do. They go from one step to the next until they have a big church. Let's finish this up. Verse 15. Okay, so for this reason, he, that is Jesus, is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, for where there is a testament, there must also be of necessity, of necessity be the death of the testor. Well, what does it mean there? <laughs> so where there's a testament. Now, go back to what I said earlier. Covenant, two people. Testament is more like a will, Right? And that's what he's saying here. Jesus, through this new covenant, didn't make a covenant with us. He made a testament with us. In other words, it's his choice to give us the inheritance. We had nothing to do with it at all. And that's important for us to understand. We have nothing to do with our salvation at all. We cannot save ourselves at all. There is not one thing we can do to save ourselves. I don't care what you believe You'll never get to heaven by your own works. And the Bible's very clear about that. It is not by your works. It is by God's grace. If it were by works, then we could boast about it and say it is because I'm a good person. The reality is we're not a good person. I do good, de good deeds. No, you don't do enough good deeds to save you. And so we have to understand that it was all his work. It's a will. It's a testament of Jesus Christ. He did it all, and then he left us all the inheritance of everything that, um, that he had done for us. In fact, there's none that are righteous, the Bible say. No, not one, Romans 3, 26. And then the Bible also says that none, that is none, not one person seeketh after God. It's God who seeks after us. And thank God for that, otherwise a lot of us wouldn't be saved. So it's his inheritance, and that inheritance, of course, when do you get an inheritance? When you die. When you die. <laughs> and so Jesus died, and so it's taken care of. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the tester lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept in all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats, with water, scarlet wool, hyssop, and 
sprinkled, sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So even in the Old Testament, they had to wash and cleanse things, purge things with the shedding of blood. And that was with the animal blood. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for, his, for us. So Jesus sits in the heavenly places right at the right hand of the Father. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. That's important. So in the Old Testament, the priests have to do it every year, every year. They have to do the same thing. Of course, that's, that's just once a year, but that's not in including all the sacrifices every day that they have to offer up. And so constantly, every year, they have to offer up, and they look to that at every year in anticipation for their sins to be washed away and for them to be purged. Jesus died once and he doesn't have to die again and again and again and again. Now, in Catholicism, and I'm not bashing Catholicism people or the believers in Catholicism, I am talking about the, the institution of Catholicism. They believe that Jesus is crucified every Sunday when you take communion. And so when you see the cross, you still see Jesus hanging on the cross. And so they have to crucify him all over again in order for your sins to be forgiven. And so they, they crucify him and they drink his blood and then uh, eat the communion at the same time to eat his body as keeping that commandment. But here, this writer says, no, 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 no. He, he doesn't need to be offered up over and over and over again. Then, verse 26, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, as it is appointed for man to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from salvation apart from sin, for salvation. Now, this is not the rapture, because it says, appear to us. Of course, the rapture, he's not going to appear to us. He's going to come, he's going to rapture us out. The second coming, he appears to us. So he's talking about the, the rapture there. Now, notice that it says that it's appointed a man to die once, and then the judgment. So that is saying that, generally speaking, when we die, then we're going to be judged by the Lord Jesus Christ. First, we have to die. So it, it is appointed. It has been appointed by God. It is part of his plan. It is um, part of the natural process that every man has to die. And then we stand before the judgment. Now, some will look at that scripture and say, aha, uh -huh. is that true? So every man has to die. So wait a minute. What about Enoch? He didn't die. He was raptured. What about Elijah, he didn't die, he was raptured. You got an error in the scriptures. If it's appointed for man to die once and then the judgment, what is going on there? You know? What happened? So, what's the answer? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but generally speaking, we all gonna die and we'll all be judged. God can make exceptions to his rules because he's God. And in those cases, they all were raptured up, you know. Now, some might say, well, Moses and Elijah, they're going to come back to earth, right? They're going to be two witnesses, and guess what? They die, and then they raptured up again. So, Moses wasn't um, raptured, you know. God took him, buried him somewhere so Satan couldn't find his body, some believe, and use it for props or whatever for the children of Israel. So he died, but Elijah didn't. He's going to come back. So uh, God, you know, the only thing I can say is God is sovereign and he makes the rules. And so if he wants to tell us that it's appointed a man to die once and then the judgment, hey, it is. And there are many that die once and the judgment does come. But if he wants to rapture someone out, 
he has that you know prerogative to do so uh, we're his creation so amen thank you for joining us for our devil 30 please share this devil you never know who might be watching god bless you all i'm glad you were watching today have a wonderful week May the Lord just bless you and keep you. Let's go ahead and pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercies, Lord, and for your love and for forgiveness of sin by the shedding of your son's blood that was once and for all. And all we need to simply do is to believe in the work of Jesus Christ and surrender our hearts to him, and he will do such a great work in our lives, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Bless my brothers and sisters who are listening, those who are coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, those who are joining us and just out of curiosity, we just pray for them, Lord, that you minister to them, that you would open up all our eyes, that we may see Jesus is the truth. He is the way. He is the life. And no one can get to the Father except through him. John 14, 6 says very clearly, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. If you'd like some prayer, please, please um, let us know there on the post and we'll pray for you or uh, private message me and we'll pray for you. Good morning, uh, Andrea, Drea, Corpus. Good to see you on there. Say hi to Frank for me. Miss you guys. We'll have to go do lunch someday for real. All right. God bless you guys.